2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul tells young Timothy, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy was a young pastor, more likely there at the church at Ephesus, and Paul leaves these words to him that Timothy's job as a pastor was to entrust the gospel to other men who are faithful, enabling them to teach others. And so it is my job as a pastor, part of my duties is to disciple other men. And as God would call them to preach and teach his word, to help them to do that very thing. We are blessed as a congregation to have men whom God has gifted to teach and to preach his word. And so the unique thing is, is Brother Garrett's giftedness probably isn't like Brother Chad's giftedness. And Brother Chad's giftedness is different from Brother Rick's or Brother Jay's or Brother Eli's. Or, our gifts are all so different, and yet God uses them to build up the body of Christ to bring him glory. And that is such a, a great joy and blessing. I want to pray for Brother Garrett real quickly, and then he's going to come. Father, open our hearts this morning to your word. Holy Spirit, have your will and your way in our lives. Speak through your servant, Brother Garrett, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You come, brother. Long. That's error. God is not good. God is not just. That we can come to His Word and we can teach them and defend the truth that yes, He is. And that's simply what this is. I don't know if you spent much time online debating atheists or just seeing comments and blogs. This particular, there's uh, three verses inside this chapter here that is used so often by atheists to attack the goodness and the moral character of our God. And so many times, it's hard to come up with a, a sound response to those questions, especially in the heat of the moment. But I want to show you that it's not really a matter of some trickery or extensive knowledge, but simply a faithful heart to humble yourself before the Word of God, to study it, to pray. And I believe through your study and prayer and meditation that, that God will give you clarity in these things. So I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to teach it. We're going to do a little bit of argumentation from it, but for the sake of time, I simply cannot argue everything that I'd like to argue. So we're going to stick with some, uh, I guess, theological arguing. We're going to put things in its cultural context, its historical context, a little bit of the linguistic context, looking at a few words, but mostly the theological context, where these people are in this passage in salvation history, from the beginning of God's creation to this point in time. So with that being said, Let's read, this is going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2, if you'll turn there. 2 Kings chapter 2. Still not on? Okay. I moved it to my back for, for comfort's sake, but I guess I better take a look at it. Is it green? How about now? I can hear myself now, yeah. That's a lot better. That's 2 Kings chapter 2. I think if you're using the uh, ESV Bible in the pulpit there, it's on ground page 306 or 307. Second Kings chapter 2, 
beginning in verse 1. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to them, or said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet... If you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed down to him on the ground. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men, and for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water, and from now on neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day according to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel. And from there he returned to Samaria. Let us pray. Father, we confess that this is your word. Your word is good. Your word is truth. Lead us to understand your word, that we might know you more, worship you more fully in spirit, and importantly, in truth. Spirit and in truth. May we not shy away from the truths of your word and from knowing who you truly are. Guide us in all these things to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Now, those last three verses there, you see there's, there's a point there that seems at first very much so to cause maybe some alarm. It's not a pleasant verse. There are these youths here that are torn by bears. Now, the author of Kings, we don't know who he is. Some think it might have been the prophet Jeremiah, for the author writes with a certain kind of uh, awareness of the mind of God, as a prophet would tell forth the words of God and have a mind of God, knowing what, what God's will is. That seems to be the perspective of the author of Kings, 
but we don't know fully who the author was. He was writing around 550 B.C., about 300 years actually after this event and this text took place. The author was in Babylonian captivity, a fulfillment of promises given by God for the covenant failures of Israel. They were taken away. And uh, so we see here that we have that to look into. Now, if I were to ask you, I've asked two others, and they got this, so hopefully it will be the same for you. If I were to ask you this question, this, this kind of, uh, I guess, riddle or parable, and see if you can answer it for me. There was once a famous man who lived in a certain city, and his home was called Graceland. Who is that man? Elvis Presley. So where, what was the city that he lived in? Memphis. And what was he known for? Music, rock and roll. So we see with just that name Graceland, we begin associating certain, certain cultural items, certain historical items, certain people. In this text, the author includes certain details that we need to stop and pay attention to. He mentions certain cities, for example, such as Gilgal, such as Bethel, such as Jericho. He mentions Mount Carmel. He mentions Samaria. He also mentions the Jordan River. He mentions, of course, Elijah and Elisha. So we have to look back and reflect, oftentimes with, uh, with life in general, when things aren't going the way we think they ought to go. When bad things happen, we often ask, you know, how did I get here? How did I get to this position and time? And where am I going? That's very much so on the mind of the author of Kings. He's writing to Israel to show them where they've been, where God has brought them, why they are where they are at this point in time, and to demonstrate what covenant faithfulness will do in restoring the promises of God. So we have to remember that God is a God of covenants, and we're going to look at some history real quick. Remember that God created everything. Heavens, the earth, he created man, and he said it was good. He created man with a moral capacity to obey God, to live faithfully. And then man sinned. We had the fall. We see the flood, God's disapproval of sin and the wickedness of sin and how much he hated it. And he wanted to eradicate sin, but still out of grace left a remainder, a remnant, a faithful remnant that he saved, preserved in the ark. And we know that today we're preserved as we are in Christ. Now he calls Abraham out of the wilderness, calls him, and Abraham responds by faith to God. Abraham goes, and we see that uh, through his lineage we have Isaac and we have Jacob. And Jacob goes, and as he's traveling in his early years, he comes to a certain place called Bethel. And there at Bethel he encounters the angel of the Lord. And what happens? He wrestles with the angel. And the angel tells him, you're no longer Jacob, but you'll be known as Israel. And thus the identity of the people of Israel, these chosen people, is given at that particular place. Now, we see that Israel enters into captivity in Egypt by God's providential plan. But God remembers his people and remembers his covenant and sends Moses the prophet to bring his people up out of Egypt and across the Red Sea to the parting of the Red Sea. We see a mighty sign there, God's hand, God's faithfulness, that he will do what he said he will do. But soon after that, what happens? Moses is up on the mount. He's with God, receiving the word of God. And what is Israel doing down below? They're fashioning a golden calf, already breaking their fidelity, their faithfulness to God. And God is displeased with that. And so that whole generation does not see the promise of God because of their sin. But God raises up Joshua, son of Nun, who takes over after Moses and takes the people of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land, land of milk and honey. And there at the city of Gilgal, they set up a memorial, 12 stones for what God has done. And they go on to con conquer Jericho by a mighty act, mighty sign from God. There Joshua announces a curse over Jericho. And what does he say? He says that whoever should build the foundation of this city, it will be at the cost of his firstborn. Whoever builds the gate, it shall be at the cost of his secondborn. So Joshua announces that curse. And as we see actually later on in 1 Kings chapter 16, Hill from Bethel goes and rebuilds Jericho. And his firstborn son and his secondborn son both die, fulfilling the curse spoken before. 
But Israel comes into the promised land, and ultimately they, they, there, they go through the period we know as uh, the period of judges. That is, characterized by everyone doing what's right in their own sight. And eventually they cry out for a king. And Moses has wrote about having a king in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And he laid out specific instructions for who this king shall be, what he shall be like. It's important to have a king after God's heart. So, Samuel the prophet goes and anoints Saul. Saul is not a faithful king. Then, Samuel goes and anoints David. And David is a man after God's own heart. He is faithful to God. And we see that despite the failures of that man, David, the sin with Bathsheba, that he never once committed the sin of idolatry. His heart was true to God. We see that men and women fail, but God wants people who are faithful to him, who will turn to him, and who will repent. David is given a son by that infidelity. Solomon is born from Bathsheba. And Solomon is the world's wisest man up until Jesus Christ. Solomon, a period of David and Solomon, we see covenant blessings abound. Those two men follow God faithfully, and we see in the time of Solomon that there was so much gold in the land that silver was as counted as stone. It was nothing. The people of Israel prospered under him. But toward the end of Solomon's life, something happened. He began acquiring for himself many wives. And this is in direct violation of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 17. Don't have for yourself many wives, for they will turn your heart away from God. Solomon's heart turns away from God near the end of his life, and he had had many political marriages, but he also began to honor their gods and build shrines, even to Moloch and to Baal, east of Jerusalem. That covenant infidelity there was a downward spiral. We see with his son Rehoboam and another man Rehoboam, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, excuse me, Jeroboam becomes the king of the northern kingdom. That's going to be the ten tribes of Israel. And then Rehoboam becomes the king of the southern kingdom, which is going to be Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom, its entire history is characterized by infidelity. Not a single king is counted to be righteous, but they're all wicked. And with every king, you see a certain phrase being used, that they walked in the sins of their father. They walked in the sins of their father. We get down. Uh, Jeroboam did something politically, uh, I guess, cunning. He wanted to unite his monarchy and keep the other people, the other tribes, from going down to the southern kingdom and him losing his monarchy. So... The significance of that is because in the southern kingdom was Jerusalem and the temple. And so what he did was in Bethel and north of there, Dan, he set up two other worship sites. And he forged golden calves to be placed in these sites. And he said, these are your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He split the worship of Israel to try and unite everyone underneath him. And that was a dark and downward spiral. Later on, we have the king Ahab. Ahab marries Jezebel from Phoenicia. She brings with her 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. And the national religion becomes Baal worship. And they, in fact, begin hunting down the prophets of Yahweh, killing them systematically. It's during this time that we see Elijah is raised up all of a sudden to combat the infidelity of Israel, to call Israel back to covenant faithfulness, to remember the promises of God. Now let's stop for a moment and think about a covenant. What is a covenant? That's an arrangement between parties where certain stipulations. Now the covenants with God are actually covenants uh, essentially of grace because he chooses to reveal himself. He chooses to extend himself in a relationship with man. He puts himself out there, but it's on certain stipulations. And we see here that there are curses and blessings listed throughout the Pentateuch, Leviticus and Deuteronomy especially. Blessings for when you walk in faithfulness. Curses for when you don't walk in faithfulness. And we see that Ahab is very unfaithful. He's killing the prophet of Yahweh. The people of Israel have turned. The people are worshiping these false gods. Elijah has the contest at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And there God honors Elijah's sacrifice. 
and the prophets of Baal are killed. And you would think after that mighty display that the people of Israel would turn back to God, but they don't. They continue in their sins and the sins of their fathers, turning away from God. Then Ahab has a son, Ahaziah. And throughout that last portion of time there, we see that Elisha is anointed, and he comes to take on the, the role of Elijah, to come on after him. Now, these idols, these false gods, let's stop for a moment and consider the nastiness, the ungodliness of these gods. You have Baal, who was often worshipped alongside Asherah. He was often worshipped through prostitution and fornication. There may have been even some sacrifice of children, but we see predominantly the sacrifice of children most strongly associated with the god Molech. Molech was the god of the Ammonites to the east of Israel. You also have the god Chemosh to the southeast. Um, Chemosh and the Moabites also received sacrifice of children. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 3, just after, just after this, we see that Mesha sacrifices his son on the wall while fighting Israel. Part of the sacrifice of children was sometimes killing the child and then throwing them in the fire. Sometimes it was just throwing children alive in the fire. We see that Jezebel, who's from Phoenicia, Phoenicia actually established a colony in Carthage. And they had a god called Kronos, who's kind of a blending of Baal and a blending of Moloch. And he received children's sacrifices. And in fact, after one of their defeats there in Carthage, they sacrificed, some believe, two to three hundred children, throwing them in the fire. And they called that worship. It was to appease a god of nature, a god who controlled the seasons, the rains, the drought. And they thought that by doing this, they were going to bring fertility and prosperity upon their land. So you see, these gods were particularly heinous. Fornication, prostitution of both males and females, child sacrifice, and the people of Israel turned their hearts from a God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the captivity, who was remembering his covenant promises. They turned their hearts to worship these gods. God was not pleased at all. And he sent, though, out of his grace, he sent prophets, people to turn their hearts back to God. He sent people to tell them of his grace, of his mercy, of his steadfast love, but to remind them that I have a covenant with you. And you are to keep these stipulations, the law. You are to do these things. And if you don't, there are punishments. There are curses that you will endure. Now, as we see that all this false worship and the grace of God in sending prophets, the audacity of Israel to turn from him, we see that Elisha here in this text is taking over the ministry of Elijah, a very notable ministry. Some things to point out in the text just to help us understand. Um, when Elijah is asking for a double portion down in verse 9, just because when I first read this, I kind of thought that seems like an odd way to ask for something. But in verse 9, you see that when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Elisha is not asking for literally twice your spiritual power. He's not asking that. This is an idiomatic expression, an idiom. That would be like saying it's raining cats and dogs. We don't mean that it's literally raining cats and dogs. We mean that it's raining very heavily. This expression is used consistently to say, I want the firstborn's inheritance. As in the one who's going to inherit your position, your kingship, whatever it might be, I want the inheritance that is due him. And in this case, Elisha is asking, to take over after Elijah, but to have the blessing that Elijah had, his spirit, his ability to proclaim the word of God. And indeed, he receives that. And God testifies to that by honoring, uh, showing the signs of crossing the Jordan. Uh, before we get to that, let's look up just a little bit at verse 12. He said, And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Now, he's referring here, Elisha's referring to Elijah, as the chariots and horsemen of Israel. This has been his master, and Elijah has been the guardian, the defender of true Israel, faithful Israel, the Israel remembering the covenant. Elijah has been the one to stand up for God 
And in wartime, the chariots and horsemen were some of the most powerful units on the battlefield. Chariots were a mighty thing for a foot soldier to go against. And so Elijah is reckoned as a mighty soldier for Christ, essentially. Now, Elisha then strikes the water. We see that Elijah struck it and they crossed over, and then Elisha strikes it and they cross back over. God took his, his prophet out of Israel, Elijah, and blessed him by taking him up so he would not see death. And then the successor, Elisha, strikes the water, the Jordan River, and crosses back over to continue ministering to the people of Israel in the Promised Land. Now that's a covenant sign. Remember that we've seen the parting of the water with the crossing of the Red Sea, the people of Israel crossing out of Egypt, God delivering them in that way, and then also Joshua leading them into the Promised Land. So that's some of the context there, the, the history, this culture, these religions that are going on here that these prophets are contesting, that are, they're fighting against these elements at work here in these generations. Now let's go on down, and we see that in uh, verse 19, there's the concern over the condition of the city, and Elisha cleans the water, so there's no more death or miscarriage. And it's right after that, as he's leaving Jericho, and goes up toward Bethel, when these youths, these small boys, these lads, depending on your translation, they come out, they jeer at him, and they say, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. So now we're going to look at kind of this hotbed right here, this, this highly contested verse, which atheists especially love to try and twist and say that God's not good. And how can you make sense of this? So, what about the age of the youths? How old were they? Because it doesn't seem hardly right at first that God would kill small babies or, or children. But we have to come to Scripture and let God be true and every man a liar. Now, there are certain words here we have to accept from the get-go that we're reading what? English. Right? I don't know what translation you have. Mine is in English. But the word was not given originally in English. It's given in Hebrew. And English translators make a faithful attempt to translate the word faithfully so that we understand and have the word in English as close as possible to the original languages. So, to look briefly but not extensively at the original language. In verse 23, we see the word used for boys is actually a word, nar. It's a word that can be used for young men and for servants. And you see that word used very often with uh, grown men who are near 30 years old. That word, nar, is used to describe Absalom when he's revolting against David. He's around 29 years old when he dies. That's the word used for that. You see, it's also uh, a word used for her dad, the Edomite, and it's actually also used in conjunction with the word kantan, which is the word for small, and also used for David when he's a young man, he's immature, excuse me, for Solomon, uh, when he's an immature man coming to the throne. So kantan can mean small in status or size or number. So without boring you with an extensive discussion of that, uh, and you're led in 24 also is another word that means children and, and can often be used for young men. From my study of it and from reading something from Answers in Genesis, which I'll read, it's a much more concise summary than, than my explanation. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and read that. Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell summarizes this. She's with Answers in Genesis at ministry there, apologetic ministry. She says, and seeing how these words are used throughout the Old Testament, we see that little child, Katan Nar, is used to describe the young rebel Hadad, the Edomite, who fled Solomon's kingdom and married Pharaoh's sister-in-law. The combination is also used by Solomon to refer to himself when he prayed for wisdom after becoming king. Thus, we can already see the phrase, little child, being used by the King James translators to refer to the relative youth or immaturity of grown men. Nar is also used to refer to David, the mighty man of valor described above, and all his brothers, as well as David's son Absalom, as he led a civil war. The field hands in Boaz's fields and a number of soldiers throughout the Old Testament, and that would include uh, soldiers when Ahab fights against Syria. Those soldiers, those men who are mustered to fight against Syria, they are called Nar. So, with that being said, what we have here is not an extreme of ages. We don't have little children. We don't have toddlers. We don't have 
preschoolers or anything like that, but we don't have grown men who are around 30 years old. Uh, I believe what's being said here is that these are adolescents. They are not yet perhaps 20, but they're of age where they could participate in war. They could be mustered and called to war, but they're immature. They are not mature men. And so they are of a particular age then where they are definitely, I think, could easily be said to be of accountability. Now that's just regarding the age there. So what about uh, the insult going up you bald head? Now what's important here, I have several points here for this, but we'll just get down to one, is that essentially the youths that were confronting Elisha were an animosity, an open rebellion to God. We often think just reading this is perhaps some simple childish insult, but it's animosity toward God, toward his people, his prophet especially, who by now the word has reached that Elijah has been taken up in this mighty display. The 50 sons of the prophets witnessed it. And now here comes Elisha up the road, and these young men, these youths, leave the city to meet him on the road. Forty-two of them are said to have been mauled. So how many much more, how much more probably were there? This is more of a demonstration against God's prophet. A generation which has grown up with religions such as Baalism and worshiping Molech and worshiping Chemosh. These are people who grew up in a generation, they are the second or third generation from Jeroboam. They are a people who grew up in a land where Moses has said, you shall read the law every seven years. That way every generation is accountable for the law. They grew up in a in a land where they were supposed to be, as Deuteronomy 6 says, continually taught by God. That fathers were to teach their children at all points during the day. Their house and their city would be known as a place where God dwells, where his word is honored and valued. So people in open rebellion against God. And that question of innocence. And I'm presenting biblical arguments here. There are other arguments that are extra biblical, scientific, moral, etc. that I think are good arguments that support much of this, but we don't have time, to be honest. So we're going with the strongest arguments, and that's the internal testimony of God's Word. In Psalm 51, we see that David writes, this is after his sin with Bathsheba, he says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David reckons himself from the womb to be living in sin, to be in a sinful world. This is not a world, unfortunately, of innocence. It's a world characterized by sin because of the fall. God had created a perfect and good world with moral creatures, with a moral capacity to honor God, to obey Him, to serve Him as He had designed. But we do not live in that that obedience. Now, how many of you love reading Leviticus? Is that not just one of your favorite books? You just crack it open. I need a devotional reading. I need some word that speaks to me today. Let's go read about some, uh, some Old Testament laws. But in fact, that's very important, okay? That's very important, and we're actually going to turn there, because I think this is one of the strongest arguments, and it's going to show you covenantal blessings and curses. So if you'll turn to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. I'll give you a moment to get there. I think oftentimes we struggle with certain things in our faith. It can be things that we experience in life. It can be things we come across in our studies that we don't know how to address, questions raised to us by others. I think it's healthy to occasionally have doubt, but I think you should have faith in God's word being inerrant, and that you can come to it and find answers, and that God is just, he is good. And, and this, I think, makes a very succinct case for it as we look at God's word in Leviticus. If you look at Leviticus 26, we'll start in verse 1. We're going to pop around in some verses real quick to, to hit some things. Verse 1, it, it begins in chapter 26 of Leviticus, verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. 
You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Let's jump down to verse 6. These are now blessings for obedience. Verse 6, I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. That's verse 6. Let's jump down to 14 and 15. Now we're getting into punishments for disobedience. But if you will not listen to me, and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, and if your soul abhors my rules, so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. He goes on to list a variety of things. Let's jump down to verse 22. And I will let loose the wild beast against you, which shall bereave you of your children, and destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. So there it is. God's people were to know His Word. God has not forgotten His Word. God is not one who has forgotten His covenant. God does not speak and waste His breath to speak in those terms. He remembers His Word, His covenant, His promises. He is faithful to His covenant. And here we have these youths coming out of the city of Bethel to confront the prophet of God who is there, who they could have very well went up to and said, tell us a word from the Lord. Tell us of our God taking us out of the land of our fathers and bringing us into a land full of milk and honey, but they cursed him and cursed God. And God had said, I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children. And there they were on the road being attacked by wild beasts. Now, uh, if we go down to verse 40 in Leviticus 26, this herein is the continual grace of God, despite covenant disobedience. Verse 40 of Leviticus 26. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walk contrary to them, and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. And verse 44, Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them, neither will I abhor them, so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. We see that ultimately Israel here, up to this point of the writing of kings, they do not turn back. Israel and eventually Judah are taken into captivity. They're taken out of the promised land. But finally, by God's providence, he changes the hearts of rulers and brings the people back. After that, they are no longer a people who actually commit the sin of idolatry. Now, they get some things wrong. We see with the Pharisees, we see some religious problems that Jesus had to address, but the problem of worshiping other pagan gods, Baal, Chemosh, Molech, that stops. And God remembers his covenant, the covenant as spoken by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, to create a new covenant, which he puts his words on our heart. We love him and we serve him. Now, so concerning bad things, I think it's so often we're quick to say that when something bad happens, we don't like, it's just bad, and maybe it's true, it, it is true, that, that bad things do happen. But it's amazing how often people who are not faithful to God, who do not serve Him, who do not care to have God involved in their day-to-day -day affairs, that they turn around and blame God for what's happened, rather, around, rather than turn around and worship Him, and seek Him out, and ask for forgiveness. Now, how do you, if you say that bad things happen, there's an inherent implication that there must be good. If you say bad things happen, then there must be good. Otherwise, it wouldn't be bad that happened. And I think atheists and humanists have a hard time accounting for this inherent goodness. And we know that there's inherently goodness in God. And God uses events such as this to discipline and chasten people. And who knows how many people who survived that attack of the bears, who heard of that, repented and turned back to God. And their souls were saved because of the disciplining, the chastening of these other youths. Now, concerning mixing good and bad, um, once you take away the goodness of something, it's no longer truly good. And 
with, in the garden, man sinned against God. And that sin meant God could no longer have a fellowship with man. God cast us out from his presence. But what's amazing is that his love and grace was such that he still endeavored and intended to make our wrong right, to extend love, love and grace and mercy. And he made a plan of forgiveness and salvation, one that leaves him being just. And I would argue justice is good. We don't have such a good justice as humans. We're, we're fallible. We make mistakes. We don't have all the knowledge in the world, all the power to affect true justice. But what you typically find, I think, is that people are all in favor of justice when they are the ones who are wronged. Then we're big fans of justice. But when we are in the wrong and facing justice, we suddenly despise it. We suddenly want mercy and not justice. We're emphatic. We love per- mercy. We are people of mercy all of a sudden. But when we're wrong, we want justice. The reality is, is that we had done wrong in God's eyes. We have committed sins. He's a just God, and he must account for the justice, his justice and our sin. He's a perfect judge, and he will do it. Is God good? Yes. The more you study the gospel, the more you see the goodness of God, because in the gospel, God takes care of everything in Christ Jesus. He takes holiness, justice, wrath, mercy, grace, love, forgiveness, and puts his glory on display so that none of his attributes and none of his goodness is violated. He has a theologically consistent plan. He's not a hypocrite. He's not a liar who just comes up with some willy-nilly plan B. Maybe this will work out. He knew from the beginning what it would take to save a people who hated him to turn their hearts back to him, to make them a people after God's own heart. Now, this is not pleasant, what we see in this passage. Usually the discipline and chastening we experience in life is not pleasant. But God's not one to delight in these things. He says in Ezekiel 33, 11, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? God can't have a relationship with people who prefer sin and sin over him. God is holy. He will not mix his goodness with bad. He cannot do it. It would violate his very character, his very being, his eternal goodness. So what we see is that we need an intercessor, a mediator, as the prophet Elisha came and interceded, taking the covenant relationship, the word of God before the people, we have a better mediator, a better prophet, a perfect king, priest, and prophet who did all that was required to make atonement for sin, to have God's attributes in perfect harmony, all that was required for us to be forgiven. So, It would seem that some people think that God has no right to be true to his word. That if he spoke and prophesied that such things would happen, that for him to follow through with it is absolutely cruel. As the designer of morality, he does what is just. And first, having given us the capacity to obey. After the fall, our moral capacity is corrupted by sin. But nonetheless, our moral capacity is there. Evidence of a good creator, a good God. Now, the flood proves that man's innate moral capacity... Is sufficient to condemn him. After that, God gives the law. And as so, God is good to give the law. And he is just to spell out the requirements so there's no confusion as to the expectations that he has for us. Yet, with our sin corrupted morality and hearts, we rail against the law. We break it time and time again. And he specifies the punishments and he demonstrates throughout all of history that he will punish sin. And then we hate God when he is true to his word, when he tells us things like Leviticus 26, 22, and he means it. We're the ones who are guilty, though, and justice is good, regardless of what we think in our guilt. The thing is, we don't deserve mercy, but he has extended it to us. It's extended by a good judge. The fullness of his mercy has been seen in these end times by this, by the interposing of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. He righteously fulfilled the requirements of the law, yet suffered for those who cannot fulfill the requirements of the law. His obedience and righteousness is credited to believers by grace through faith, 
while our disobedience and unrighteousness was placed upon him on the cross. He suffered and died, and thereby took the punishment due our sin. Yet his innocence and goodness and God's satisfaction is proven by Jesus' resurrection. By faith we are considered in Christ, which means for one thing that God is now satisfied with us. God has accomplished the impossible in Christ without violating his goodness and justice. His righteous demands are vindicated on the cross, and his love and faithfulness towards sinners is proven true. God accomplished atonement. Atonement, that word means at one meant. We're at one with God now because of Christ Jesus. The poisonous waters of our soul have been cleansed. We have living water. The darkness and pollution of our souls has been cleansed, and we're brought into fellowship again with a holy God. He has brought in the bad and made it good. God is good. And at the judgment, he's going to take this mixture of good and bad at the judgment seat, and he's going to separate it for one final time. There will be no more mingling of good and bad at that point. There will only be good and holiness and righteousness. As Elijah said to the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, Today, people of Israel... Why do you waver between two opinions? But choose for yourself today whether you will serve God or your idols, these other gods. As Joshua said in coming to the promised land and taking hold of the promises of God, he said, I don't know about you, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's the choice we have today and every day in all the struggles and things we encounter. It's a choice to remain faithful. God is faithful, and he remains faithful to us. We should be faithful, persevere in faithfulness. That's the one single exhortation. There's one thing to walk away from this is God is a God who remembers his covenant. He remembers his people. Have faith. Trust in him. He is good. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, the fact that you forgive sin. God, sometimes we confess. We come to your word, and we don't always understand it. We don't always just see the truth right away. We have to dig. Sometimes we have to cry out to you. Sometimes we have to go to others. Father, in the end, we have to be humbled. God, I thank you that you forgive sin, that you love us, you've called us, and that you've placed your spirit in us, the guarantee of our inheritance in heaven. Father, be glorified this day. Those who are here today struggling with health issues, with just spiritual issues, Father, whatever it may be, May they persevere. May you preserve them in faith. May they draw near to you rather than turn away. Father, may they have faith in you, the God who is working all things out together for good. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.